Welcome to Neswish, the city famous not just for its amazing castle, but for the rich Jewish heritage. And today, our Jewish heritage expert, Tamara Vrashitska, will tell you more about the amazing story of Neswish and the story of the Jewish community of Neswish. This is Nesvish. This is the residence of the Radzivils, the richest noble family on the territory of the Lithuanian Commonwealth, the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. They say they were richer than the Polish king. And it's true. This castle in Nesvish was their main residence and the Radzivils settled here in the 16th century in this castle. The Radzivils uh, were belonged to different faiths. Uh, some of them were Catholic, some of them were Protestant at some point. One of them became uh, Jewish uh, because he adop adopted Judaism. Uh, and the Radicals had their own attitude towards the Jews. I mean, the Jews were necessary for such people, for noble families. It is known from the history of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania that even Grand Duke Alexander, um, who used the uh, Jews who lived in, in the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, and probably borrowed uh, too much money from them, at some point he decided to get rid of the Jews. And he expelled every single Jew from the state. But five years later, uh, he realized that it doesn't go, it doesn't work without the Jews, so he asked them to come back. The Radzivils were much cleverer uh, because uh, they, in every place, including Nesvish, they set up a certain quarter for the Jews, which was called Radzivils Juridica. And the Jews who lived in this street or in some streets, they were subordinate only to the Radzivils and they didn't have to pay any other taxes, for example, in the town. Uh, of course, they were useful for the Radzivils and they were happy to serve the Radzivils because uh, I don't know any single fact from the long history of the Radzivils that any of them was anti-Semite. Usually it is stated that the relations between the Radzivils and the Jews were good. And this is true for the 16th century, and for the 70s, and for the 20th century as well. Because the Radzivils owned this castle and lived here until 1939. <laughs> This place is about 500 meters away from the castle and this is the place where one of the biggest massacres that took place in Nesvish happened. Here, in October 1941, fascist invaders shot 1,500 peaceful citizens. Uh, people who were killed here, they were Jews. But it's typical for the Soviet uh, policy to call them peaceful citizens and thus making them, well, one of many. Uh, they were not, they're not buried here because they were reburied in 1965 to a common cemetery. This massacre is described by David Farfell, who 
was imprisoned in the ghetto and then he was one of those who knew about a group of Jews who were selected and brought to the castle uh, because all the Jews were gathered in the marketplace and the first selection took place there. Uh, the whole crowd was divided into two groups. One group, 1,500 people were marched here. A small group was sent to the castle and they didn't know what was awaiting them. They had to wait there until the killing was over and then clothes was brought to the castle to sort out. The best clothes was normally uh, either sent to Germany or sold out. Uh, those uh, group, a small group of Jews who were in the castle, they were given a meal in the castle. And then when they did their job, they were sent back to the market and joined a very small group of those who survived and for whom a ghetto was set up. So this happened in October 1941 and it was in fact the beginning of the ghetto in Neswish. The other group, which was short, uh, approximately of the same size, a little bit smaller, probably 1,200 people, they were marched in a different direction uh, along the street leading to Snov and uh, they were killed in that place. Behind me is the town hall, the city hall. It was built uh, in the 16th century, of course, by the Radzivils. In 1586, the King of Poland granted Magdeburg right to the citizens of Neswij, and the Jews uh, were made equal with other citizens of this town. Uh, they enjoyed the same privileges, the same freedoms for uh, being involved in different businesses, in, uh, in trade. And uh, this was typical of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. This square, which we have all around, used to be a market square. And this was the place where the Jews of Neswij uh, were brought or were ordered to come to in October 1941 for the selection. They used to know this place for different reasons because the marketplace was always a busy place. There were shops all around. Uh, these arches, which you can see, used to be entrances to different shops. Uh, about 30 shops and kiosks here in the market and they were <laughs> trading with uh, other places. Uh, they traded flax, they traded leather um, and some other goods. At the end of the 19th century, uh, Neswish had the biggest Jewish community, about 72% of the total population. In numbers, it was a bit more than 5,000 Jews here. But because of uh, World War I, the population of Neswish declined in general, and Jewish population in particular Jews were a bit more than 3,000 when Poland was established here in 1921. Old buildings in Neswij very often uh, st stand next to modern constructions. This house, which is called the house of an artisan, uh, is regarded to belong to someone whose name was Anilevich. The house is built in the same Baroque style as some old constructions in Nesvij. Uh, you can see here the front of this house with the balcony. We are at the beginning of the street, of the Jewish street. 
in fact, there are many houses in this street which remind us about the Jewish community. Uh, during the holidays, uh, and especially uh, one week before the Easter holiday, uh, the gates to the street were closed on the order of the Radzivils, of Prince Radzivil. The Jews lived here and uh, were involved in different businesses. As we know, Jews owned shops, hotels, uh, taverns in Neswish. One of the taverns, uh, one of the building of the tavern is here. This building was built in 1901, but if we look at the front of the building, you see the elements of the same Baroque style typical for Neswish. This beautiful red brick building, which houses a post office today, used to be a gymnasia before the war. And it was a Jewish uh, gymnasium for girls, a four-year gymnasium owned by Rosenberg. Uh, in general, uh, there were different kinds of school for Jewish youth in Neswish, from uh, religious schools, from header to religious schools and to circular Tarbut schools. Uh, there was a school, a private school for boys, but only one year school. For girls, it was for four years. Besides, uh, Jewish children could also go to a Polish school, uh, although there was a quota for uh, Jewish kids at the Polish school. Luckily, this building survived and remind us about the history of the Jews of Nisi. We are on the corner of Leninskaya Street and Chikalov Street and what I see here is a fire brigade depot where they keep their machines and this building used to be a synagogue. It was called Kazimir Synagogue because the whole area is called Kazimir, Kazimir in Polish. This is the back of the Kazimir Synagogue. Uh, when we look at the front, we don't see anything which reminds us about the synagogue. But at the back, this building hasn't been renovated, uh, although it was really rebuilt several times, as I can judge. I believe that the four windows we see here, they were cut um, in the last decades. But there are some decorations which uh, suggest or give us reasons to suggest that the, this was the back of the synagogue and uh, the symbols of Aaron Koidosh could be found on this wall of the synagogue. Opposite the street, Shimko number no. one, the corner of Shimko number no. one and Leninska City Street, is the house of one of the active participants of the ghetto uprising here in Neswish, whose name was Sholom Kholavsky. The, historically, this street was called uh, Mirskaya Street because it leads in the direction of Mir. Sholom Kholavsky survived the uprising. Uh, and uh, he wrote a book of memoirs. He was one of the uh, writers of the history of Nisvish and the history of the uprising. Thanks to him, we know many details about Nisvish. just crossed the border of the Neswish ghetto. The border ran across along the street and uh, uh, when it was created and it was created one day after the massacre of October 30, 1941, when 3,000 Jews were murdered and only 500 survived, 
So the ghetto was for, for those 500 Jews. The territory of the ghetto, that's why, was obviously small. It was only 150 meters one way and 250 meters the other way. Uh, the conditions in the ghetto in Nesvish were better than in other ghettos uh, because uh, there were not so many people and because uh, at the very beginning they were allowed to go back to Jewish houses and take only food. All the furniture, all the other things, they were for the Germans, they were for the police, but not for the Jews. But they were allowed to bring food to the ghetto. And besides, there were uh, gardens here, so they could uh, grow some vegetables and use them. The situation was really not bad because there was a synagogue on the territory of the ghetto and Jews could pray and they had a school for kids here in the ghetto. Uh, it didn't last long. Uh, the situation uh, went from not very good or, or bad to worse uh, by the summer of 1942. Uh, the food became scarce and they had to trade through the windows, by the way, of the houses. They could trade with uh, local people. And besides, uh, some women worked outside. They did laundry for the uh, Germans and two women. Uh, they worked uh, as cleaners, as cleaning lady for the uh, commandant's office, Außen Kommandatur, which is just across the street. So they had to cross the street uh, to get to their working place. This building of the Außen Kommandatur was also a place where ammunition and weapons were stored. So these brave girls, uh, they used to bring parts of weapons to the ghetto. That's how a machine gun was assembled. In the morning, those who didn't find or didn't have a place where to hide, they came, all came to the gate. The gate was approximately here. They all came to the gate uh, and when they heard that only 30 people will survive, uh, they opened fire. They met uh, the police and the Nazis who entered the ghetto with uh, whatever they had in their hand, with stones, with metal bars. You know, they didn't have much weapons, in fact, but they had a machine gun. And the machine gun started firing from the synagogue. Some houses were set to fire. Uh, it's impossible now to imagine what was here going on, but there was hardly any chance for anybody to survive, and yet 40 people survived. 40 people, uh, some of them spent five days in hiding, without water, without food, uh, in smoke, everything was in smoke here. They uh, later left the town, went to the forest and found partisans. Uh, one group joined um, Fyodor Kapusta, who was in charge of a partisan unit, and the other, uh, headed by Markvinsky, they went to the Nalibaki forest and they joined uh, the Belsky brothers, who accepted every Jew and survived till liberation in the Nalibaki forest together with Tuvia Belsky. We are approaching the ghetto territory from the other side. Uh, recently there was a monument put up here to commemorate the last Jews of Nesvish who fell victims of the massacre in July, on July 2021, 20, 1942. It 
it looks like a park today, but it used to be a Jewish cemetery. When the Jews of Nesvish built their uh, synagogue at the beginning of the 17th century, uh, the community was registered, in fact, and they got a permission to have their own cemetery. So beginning from the 16th century until the war time, the Second World War time, Jews who lived in Nesvish were, and died in Nesvish, they were buried here. Unfortunately, the cemetery didn't survive. What we see here are a couple of matsevas lying down on the ground. But luckily, the bodies are in the ground. The bodies are buried here. So this territory is well kept, more or less. The grass has been recently cut. It's not overgrown, it looks like a park. And people who walk here through this park, they know that it used to be a Jewish cemetery. Unfortunately, there is no sign stating that the history of the Jewish community of Nesvish is here. Because there were many uh, prominent people and ordinary people living in Nesvish at different times. Uh, prominent rabbis like Gaon, uh, Mikhail Elhanan Spector, for example. He was a rabbi in Nesvish for five years. There were uh, people, learned people here in Nesvish as well. This is the end of once glorious Jewish community of Nesvish. Mm -hmm.